scary. with that is it encourages people that hey if I've got a gun I can use it. It's like, well, it's like no you got no you got to train. Yeah. Good evening, Ms. Clerk. We would ask that all um, potential appointees sit in the uh, gallery area, not at the news press table, please. Force a habit, sir. Sorry about that. <laughs> I had to do it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's about 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday, July 20th, 2022. We're in the City County Building. Welcome to the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Committee of the City County Council. We'll start our meeting tonight with our introductions of our counselors in the front row. Councilor Bain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Josh Bain, representing District 20 on the southwest side. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Paul Anne, representing District 23, Perry Township. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike Dilk, District 24. Thank you, counselors in the middle row. Councilor Evans. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Councilor Ethan Evans, District 4, Northeast Side. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dan Boots, District 3, Washington, Lawrence Townships. Thank you, Councilors. And to my left, Councilor Barth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John Barth, representing District 7. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Jared Evans, representing District 22 on the west side. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. William Oliver, District 9. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Frank Mascari, District 21, Southeast Side. Thank you, Councilors. I'm Leroy Robinson, representing District 1 and Chair of the Committee. We have three appointments on our agenda and one proposal. First appointments proposal 1170, I'm sorry, 1700, appoints Abdul Hakeem Shabazz to the Marion County Public Defender Board. Mr. Shabazz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, would you please speak to our, we do have your resume, pretty extensive resume. Uh, you want to speak to our committee members about why you'd like to be appointed to this board? Uh, yes, I've uh, been in uh, Indianapolis for almost 18 years now. It'll be 18 years on September 5th, believe it or not, which is also my anniversary. So let my wife know I did not forget that very important date. Uh, I've always been a believer in public service. I've covered the city council, court, Smearin County, like I said, almost two decades, had an opportunity to serve. Uh, public defender is a little bit of a different creature for me because my, my background is more of a more of a prosecutorial round. But I think at the end of the day, uh, having different voices from different parts of the city uh, will be a good thing for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Bass. Comments and questions uh, on this proposal, please, Councillor Muscari. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you do know you don't get paid for this, correct? It I'm, is volunteer. I am well aware. <laughs> okay. Thank you for serving, though. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Council. Additional comments or, or questions on this proposal. Seeing none, anyone in the audience care to present or speak to this proposal? Councilor? Is there a question? I'm sorry, I thought Councilor Renee had a question, but he changes. Councilor Renee? I just wanted to thank Mr. Shabazz for stepping up to the plate to serve on the Marion County Defender Board, and I would like to be added as a co sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Renee. Additional comments or questions? Councilor Oliver. Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shabazz, uh, thank you so much for coming forward. Uh, we've agreed on a lot of things in the past, and I anticipate a whole lot of things. And, uh, and uh, we've had some uh, good discussions. And I'm looking forward to uh, hope my colleagues uh, do likewise and support your nomination. Thank you, sir, for coming forward. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Council, have you agreed on a lot of things with Mr. Shabazz? A lot of things? I wasn't clear. All but one. Excuse me? <laughs> I wasn't sure if I heard you correctly. 
Additional comments. Anyone in the audience can I speak to this proposal? Seeing none, the chair entertain a motion. Councilor Boots, a uh, motion is properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, Ms. Clark, you want to do a roll call vote, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Arne? Councilor Arne, aye. Councilor Bain? Councilor Bain, aye. Councilor Barth? Barth, aye. Councilor Boots? Boots, aye. Councilor Delk? Councilor Delk, aye. Councilor Ethan Evans? Councilor Ethan Evans, aye. Councilor Jared Evans? Councilor Jared Evans, Councilor aye. Mascari? Councilor Mascari, aye. Councilor Oliver? Councilor Oliver, aye. Chairman Robinson? Robinson, aye. Councilor Carlino. Councilor Carlino, aye. Thank you, Councilor Carlino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Proposal Thank you, Ms. Passes. Clerk. Uh, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Shabazz. We'll see you uh, in about a few weeks at the full council. You don't have to attend, uh, but it will be on the agenda. But thank you for your willingness to want to serve. And by the way, I just want to say for the record, I have not, nor have ever been a member of the Communist Party. So I just want to <laughs> get that out the way. Thank you, sir. We'll be doing our background. Don't worry. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Shabazz. Uh, next is the proposal 202-2020, appoints Matthew Dotson to the Marion County Public Defender Board. Mr. Dotson, you want to come forward, please? So we also have your resume in our possession. We reviewed it. And please share with us what you'd like to be appointed to this board. Yes, sir. I've lived in Indianapolis my, nearly my entire life outside of the time that I spent away at school. I believe very strongly in the Constitution and the right to a defense, and I look forward to improving uh, and working uh, alongside with everyone on the board. Thank you again, just for those in the public, we do have his resume, it is extensive. So thank you, sir, for your willingness to serve on this board. Comments or questions from counselors? Councilor Bain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, just wanna say thank you, Matt, for your willingness to serve on this board. And um, please let us know if there's anything we can do to help you and uh, vice versa. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Boots. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I too wanted to thank Mr. Dodson for his public service, um, being a friendly neighbor of District 3. Um, I also want to, uh, uh, if I may, be added as a co-sponsor of this and encourage our uh, unanimous approval of Mr. Dodson. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Boots. Mr. Commons, Councilor Evans, Jared Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick question. Where'd you go to high school at? I graduated from Pike High School in 2002. Okay. I won't give you no, no stuff on that, all right? At least it's West Side. Great school. Thank you. Councilor Oliver? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dotson, uh, just a quick question here. On your resume, you got where you bring it all together. You were going to deal with Indiana trafficking? Uh, yes, sir. I've spoken. Yeah, well, tell me what that was about, just in general terms, what conclusion was reached? Well, I don't think there was a conclusion that was reached other than that there's a, pan, a, a real epidemic of human trafficking, especially among the youth population, not only locally, but nationally, and that the more people who are aware of it, the better, uh, and the more cooperation we have between agencies, the better. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Anyone in the audience care to speak to Proposal 202? I see our public defenders here. Any comments on 170 or 202, Mr. Hill? Thank you, thank you. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion on 202. Councilor Boots. Motion will probably moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Clerk, you want to do a roll call vote, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Renee. Councilor Renee, aye. Councilor Bain. Councilor Bain, aye. Thank you. Councilor Barth. Barth, aye. Councilor Boots. Boots, aye. Councilor Carlino. Carlino, aye. Councilor Delk. Councilor Delk, aye. Councilor Ethan Evans. Ethan Evans, Mascari. aye. Councilor Jared Evans. Councilor Jared Evans, aye. Councilor Mascari. Mascari, aye. Councilor Oliver. Councilor Oliver, aye. Chairman Robinson. Uh, Robinson, aye. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Proposal passes. Thank you, Ms. Clerk. Thank you, Councilors. Mr. Uh, Dotson, we look forward to seeing you uh, in a few weeks at the full council. But again, you do not have to attend. Uh, you have the United United States support of this committee. So thank you for your willingness to serve. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Up, let, up next is our last proposal, Proposal 243. Approves additional appropriations totaling $3,762,263 of the 2022 budgets of the Marion County Corner, Department of Metropolitan Development, 
Office of Public Health and Safety, Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department, and the Indianapolis Fire Department, and the county state grant funds to finance treatment, education, and prevention programs for substance use disorder or mental health issues from the opioid settlement to be received by the state of Indiana and distributed to local governments. Director Rodriguez. Welcome to you and your team. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Feel free to introduce your stellar team to I, uh, I, I am, I am, I'm sorry. Um, so we do have the um, representat representatives from IFD, coroner's office, IMPD, and then my office as well. Um, to discuss, to answer any questions that any of the council may have. But we can start with Mike. Do you want to say your name and your title? Good evening, Michael White. I'm the Assistant Chief with the Indianapolis Fire. Hello, Alfie McGinty, Chief Deputy Coroner with the Marion County Coroner's Office. Good evening, Councilors. My name is Kendall Adams, Deputy Chief of Criminal Investigations Division for Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. And then Josiah Johnson is behind me as well. He um, works at he works as a manager with the CJC and the reentry team at OPHS. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Chairman. Each of the councils do have a packet of the presentation on their desk, and there also be a virtual one for those in the audience. Thank you. So um, I don't know if everyone knows, but the city is receiving some settlement dollars for opioid, um, the, op the opioid settlement dollars. This is going to be the, what we're talking about tonight is the first round of an anticipated two rounds of funding this year. And we don't have an exact dollar amount, but we were given in terms of disbursement. We know the exact dollar amount for the entire settlement, but it's going to be up to the um, defendants that are going to give us the money to stagger how they're going to pay the city. But it's supposed to be over 18 years. Um, and so what we're doing right now is we're trying to utilize the information from the settlement to uh, distribute these dollars amongst the city agencies and for into programmings that address opioid um, overdoses and mental health um, illnesses. So the, challenging of, the challenges of addressing substance use disorder, I'm sure you all know, right? We've had conversations, I've had conversations with many of you about the stigma around it, right? Just saying that I may have a problem can be hard for people. Um, COVID-19 exacerbated that stigma, exacerbated the um, keeping people inside, right? And not addressing either mental health and or substance use disorders. We also have the impact that it's not a, it only affects one population. It affects everyone. Everybody can come into contact with substance use disorders and or mental health disorders. There's barriers in accessing affordable care and holistic treatments. We also have difficulties in building trust with those who have those disorders. Um, and it's not just the programs themselves, the healthcare providers, but it's also our communities, right? Talking to our family. Um, you know, personally, I know people in my own family that even though we're, we have blood relation, they don't want to admit certain things because it's a hard thing to tackle. Um, access to life-saving medication has also been an issue and the continuum of care. But I will say that tonight in the presentation, this is a great step forward of how all agencies can come together and programs out in the community to address these concerns. So how did we arrive? I mentioned earlier that this was this is going to be the first of multiple installments. Um, but. We, when we looked at this, we knew that the settlement dollars were coming. We also made sure that we checked in with each other. So the importance of having all of these different represent representatives from the different agencies is because we knew that not one agency can fit, fix this. We knew that not one organization, not one healthcare system can fix this. This needs to come from a collaborative approach. So we've had discussions with IMPD, DMD, IFD, the um, 
the coroner's office. We've also had conversations with um, programs out in the community. We've looked at the statistics to see how we can address this. And we wanted to make sure that this fit within the um, programming set out by the council by making sure that the ARPA dollars that we set aside last year that this goes along with them and making sure that we're also learning to address gaps that weren't present to us last year. This is not something that will be a one-size-fits-all and so we're always learning new and innovative ways of, ad of addressing this. Now there may be more dollars coming but we can't anticipate that so this is just one manufacturer and three distributors. Um, there, are, I believe, are three more manufacturers that are in litigation right now, so there could be more money coming from them. We just don't have that information yet. So what we wanted to focus on in round one were these four um, areas. Vulnerable populations, crisis response, and then naloxone, longer term care, and then the administrative support behind it to make sure that these programs are pushed along and setting up and being sustainable in the future. So we broke down the different amounts for each of those areas. And this is the first three areas. So money towards a mobile health clinic, um, allowing for, you know, not everybody has a home, not everybody um, has a place to lay their head every single night. So making sure that we're allowing access to those individuals who may be unsheltered, right, to have a mobile clinic come to them. Um, we're also highlighting the need for um, individuals who are formerly incarcerated, um, making sure that if they leave the Marion County Jail, they have access to a naloxone kit or a couple. Um, maybe they don't use it, maybe it's not for themselves and maybe it's for a loved one, but making sure that we are combating those vulnerable populations. A crisis response. Um, so we can go into more detail about this as well. They, we want to make sure that we are prepared for when we see multiple overdoses or multiple people getting arrested for drug use in a specific area. What, instead of just, you know, getting at the drug, but we need to get at the root, right? What is it that people are taking those drugs for? Is it because, what does their addiction lead to? So we need to make sure we follow up with response to them, bringing them the resources, asking them the questions. And then making sure that we also distribute the naloxone for them for free. Um, and then the longer term care. We know that this is not something where if we give you a naloxone box that everything is going to be okay. Um, and it might take time, it may take longer time for some individuals to respond and agree that they need help. But in the meantime, how can we continue working with them and seeing what they need and bringing, meeting them where they are? Um, so I, Alfie is going to talk more about the voucher-based program for mental health services and how that can fit into a longer-term continuum of care for these individuals. And then recovery housing. Um, being um, in meetings with the AIC, I hear a lot about how there's not a lot of recovery housing. Um, and so making sure that we're investing into those types of organizations too so that way when people are willing to, okay, I'm gonna take that next step and go into a 28-day program, that they have beds available for them. And then the administrative part of this is, you know, making sure that we have trainings. Um, I know Councilor Carlino had asked me about the $400 <laughs> budget, but that it was, that's a real number. Um, Alfie was very good at negotiating um, training for individuals on the city side to receive training for these types of services. Um, we also need to be held accountable, so we wanted to make sure that we build research into this and allowing people to track the data and the number to see the impact of what we're doing and then just equipment and staffing as well. With that, um, does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Director Rodriguez. Councilor Muscari, first question, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, going over your round, to round one programming, this is just for this year, uh, 2022, or is it going to carry over into two, two, uh, next year, 23? So I believe that's more of an OFM question, but I believe the way that they um, broke it up, and I know Jake's here from OFM, um, but the, the way I see it is, the way I understood it is that this, the numbers here are for the remaining of 2022, 
and there might be a second round of funds coming in 2022 in addition to this am i right so, so there's no funding for next year my the mobile health clinic how many uh, mobile health buses are we going to or whatever what, can you explain that a little better Councilor uh, Mascara, can, can Jake answer? I think there, there is more money coming each year, but I think Jake has a better answer than I do. Hi. Your name for the record, please. Good evening, Jake McVeigh with uh, Office of Finance and Management. I'm the budget manager for the public safety and criminal justice agencies. So this uh, proposal in front of you tonight is for appropriation for the 2022 budget. Um, we would anticipate Based off of the um, based off of estimates for future uh, future disbursements for uh, appropriations in, in those years, so we're not going to appropriate any more than we anticipate receiving. And at this time, we just have estimates for the first round of uh, disbursement from the state. One more question, Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the voucher-based mental health services. Will, will we focus on uh, the homeless population? We have a problem with homeless. Most of them are, have, have addiction problems. How can we focus our message there with the, the, that population? Good afternoon. Um, so the voucher-based program can be a voucher that's used by any of our Marion County population. So it's just a situation where if, for example, IMPD has a, a person um, who is in need of mental health counseling or assistance, they can be given a voucher to be used um, for that mental health assessment as well as mental health treatment and referrals into mental health as well as wraparound services to follow them through the process of getting those mental health treatments, medication if necessary, if that's gonna be the case. Um, so this is a broad based kind of look at um, who is in need of the services and having the, the vouchers and the funding available for those people to get the services that they need. Okay, one, one follow up question. Thing. Okay, the next month we're having a meeting about the homeless. I would love to have 50 vouchers ready for this this coalition to hand out to the homeless. So could you possibly have some vouchers for us? So because nothing has been approved, we, approve we did not anticipate being able to move you know, in, at that rate. I do have um, three mental health facilities that are ready to jump in and assist. Um, I don't know, you know how the, that voucher system is going to work because we hadn't gotten approval for that. We have a plan. Um, but if next month, if you want information as to how that can be provided to um, to homeless, um, the homeless population, or those seeking yeah, mental health services, we can look at that. We, we have a huge crowd probably coming to the next meeting. I'd love to be able to say, here are some vouchers. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. This is comments. Councilor Jared Evans, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Rodriguez, thank you for the update and information and to your team. Um, as I think I've shared somewhat offline, I, moving forward when, as we get those additional payments over the next couple of years, I, I wonder what it would look like to um, start to put a plan together that addresses the access for people who don't have the money or the insurance to get that help when they want to get help and they want to get off the drugs or the substance abuse. Um, I, I, I'm supportive of what I see here. I just I feel, feel like this is a missing component. Um, you know, as I've mentioned, talking with the families and the folks that I know that address it, it's typically that they don't have the financial resources to get or receive the help that they need. That, that I'm assuming, again, I'm educated in this field, but that take them a little bit out of their environment and you know they're they're at rehab or treatment for a couple of weeks, maybe months getting that help so um, as we move forward I you know I don't know if that's a plan that you guys are all even considering but if you are I'd love to see what that may look like in the future and how many people we could help and who our partners may be with that uh, the the second comment I have is that um, <clears throat> representing Wayne Indicator Township both those areas they're their fire departments obviously not a part of IFD um, but our taxpayers do pay into the public safety tax that we receive so I'm wondering 
how much of this is being coordinated with those departments as well? Uh, because we have our own ambulance service, our own firefighters that arrive on scene that are not IFD or IEMS. And I think it's just as important um, that those departments are receiving help as well or, or the resources that we're giving IFD to help address this. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and we, we are including um, those areas as well, um, any of the donut areas, to give the naloxone boxes. We're trying to make sure that every single station, IMPD, IFD, Wayne Township Fire Department, they all have these naloxone boxes located at their facility so that they can help give those out as well. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Barth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think um, Councillor Evans comment is a really good one about the continuation of services over time and um, on the vouchers and we talked about this offline too the that this is really good and it will help with access to any of identified providers who are willing to take it but the just a comment is the next step would be to make sure those providers are working with the individuals served to make sure that they have access to Medicaid or Medicaid expansion with the Healthy Indiana Plan to ensure that they have coverage going forward after those um, vouchers are expired because if not, that may be um, good money that's spent that doesn't uh, get us any positive results. So that's just a comment that the, the Councillor Evans is spot on that that um, follow along care has to happen and that's only gonna happen if there's coverage um, that's available for those folks. Um, my more specific question is on the mobile health clinic. So I know that's gonna be essentially donated to a provider. So a couple of questions there. If it's donated to a provider, uh, number one, with that donation, is there expectations uh, uh, as far as how many individuals will be served in a given year and for a period of time? And are we setting any expectations for any kind of outcomes we expect to see? And are they gonna report that back to us? Um, that's one. And number two is those uh, mobile health clinics, I know for some previous experience, are complicated entities and they can break down. And when they break down, it's very expensive. So we might be donating something that becomes a really a fancy lemon just sitting in their parking lot if there's not any funds available for it to be repaired over time. Or have they agreed to um, absorb and do they have the funding to uh, uh, take care of any repairs that might come? Thanks, Councillor. Um, so to go to your first question about the data and the reporting and the goals that we would set, uh, yes, that is part of the discussions. Um, we didn't want to send set any of those right away until we knew that we could give the money towards this. Um, however, we've been in many discussions about how this clinic could actually run. Um, I was actually working with Gordon Smith, who is a VSO, a veteran service officer, about a program this way so he had already done a lot of research about what are the metrics that we want to address in these areas um, and so we will definitely keep you guys updated um, and counselor I would love to sit down and talk to you about those and see what your thoughts are as far as absorbing the costs of any mechanical issues or any issues at all for the vehicle that provider would definitely incur those costs and this would be a one-time disbursement that's it Okay, well, and just to make a just to make a point about um, uh, a experience I had in the past in a previous life when I ran um, uh, a big marketing department, we funded a nonprofit to have a clinic, and within two years that um, mobile clinic uh, stopped operating, and they um, couldn't operate it for several years until we gave them another donation. And so I, my point is, those mobile clinics are complicated bits of machinery, and um, I. Uh, I, I would suggest that with any donation of this, you ask them if they're budgeting for ongoing maintenance of this, because I hate to see this thing sitting there not generating any, any results for us. Thank you, Councillor. Thank Counselor you. Councillor Ethan Evans, comments or questions? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, a couple questions. Uh, one was a follow-up to Councillor Barth um, on the mobile clinic. Um, I know you had said you were waiting to set, you know, the data, specific data and goals. Um, when you had a provider, um, would you be able to say, um, or would you have to wait and say when and where one would operate um, when you did um, have the mobile health clinic up and running? Um, and also, uh, who are the organizations you have lined up for the recovery housing funding? 
Thank you. So to answer your first question about when and where about the mobile unit, um, part of the contracting that can always be discussed. I will say that these dollars are for Marion County residents, um, and we we always and we always tell everybody up front like this is supposed to serve Marion County residents first. Um, now, can I dictate the schedule? I don't think so, but that's part of the contracting process and negotiation. So. Um, to Councilor Barth's point, though, we can definitely set metrics and goals that have to be reported back to us on it. Um, and back to Councilor Barth about the um, addressing the maintenance issue. I mean, we can even look at, okay, if you guys no longer use the unit for whatever reason, then gifting it back to the city so that we can try to do that. Suddenly that's what we're looking into as well. Um, as far as the recovery housing piece, no, that's on DM, that would, the dollars would go to DMD to help make those assessments. But, you know, one of the, one of the examples for recovery house is um, the Heart Rock um, recovery house that was just opened with Overdose Lifeline yesterday at the ribbon cutting to help women who are either pregnant and or have children who are going through recovery. So it'd be things like that. Councilor, you good? Councilor Boots. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director Rodriguez, for the presentation this evening. Just a, a quick question, and maybe this might be better directed at Deputy Chief Adams, and that is, is there a possibility for any of these funds to be directed toward um, IMPD's expansion of the MCAT program? I know that's not solely in your court, but um, we, we hope to see, and maybe this is a part of the budget discussions as well, but we, we hope to see a considerable expansion of that program coming up in the next couple of years. Can, can you shed any light on that topic tonight? Sure, thank you for the uh, question. So, you know, we continue to work with OPHS and the city in terms of expanding that program. Dr. Director Rodriguez is working really hard to craft a uh, plan that is sustainable for both IMPD and the MCAT program. So we've already added additional officers and looked at expanding uh, the additional time that they're available uh, with the hope that it'd be 24 seven, seven days a week. And so I'm confident that while these funds are specific to uh, narrowly focused to opioid uh, deaths and mental health, that the plan that uh, OPHS is working on and hopefully will present uh, in a separate uh, appropriation will address the need to have those teams 24 seven, seven days a week. Great, thank you, and I look forward to that discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor, Councilor Rene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your presentation tonight, Director. I was curious, what are some uh, short-term and long-term relief um, items through these dollars as they are being allocated um, for your agency and the agencies represented tonight? What, what are some short-term and long-term uh, goals that we're looking to meet maybe a little bit quicker uh, with these extra dollars. Thank you, Councilor Renee. I'm going to say something very quickly and then defer to Alfie, who has all the statistics on this. But Alfie can correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe Marion County at this point is around, we are looking at around a 20% increase in overdose deaths this year. Um, and so the naloxone is both long term and short term. Right, we need to make sure that people have access to these types of resources right now. The long term is definitely these vouchers, right? Making sure people have access to therapy services and wraparound services to treat these mental health and or substance use disorders is critical. Um, and then to Councillor Evans' point where we need to, and Councillor Barth's point to where we need to look at, okay, what a, what's a more long term housing situation or recovery house situation. Um, we need to look into those inpatient stays and see where that data that data is. But I can let Alfie speak further on that. Thank you for the question. So we are targeting um, the top five zip codes where we have seen drug overdose deaths. And not just dealing with the deaths, but dealing with those communities. For example, um, the top five um, zip codes would include some of your districts including District 12, 17, District 16, Dix District 21, and District 22, District 9, and District 13. Um, so in those districts, that's where we are seeing large numbers of drug overdose deaths. And with that, though, we're going into, we are partnering with a community 
um, agency that is going to go into those age into those communities leave harm reduction um, information such as uh, naloxone in those areas um, knock on doors identify those um, people in those communities that need the help so we are identifying it from sort of a top down um, to identify what are what are the goals and I'd love to hear from some of you to identify what are some of the goals in your specific districts which some of your districts are identified within these top five so primarily one goal is to make sure that if people say that they want care to give them the resources of where to go what we have done so far with no money <laughs> is just simply talking to the families that we have direct contact with that have said yes i need services like i need mental health we know that there is intergenerational substance use substance abuse and drug overdose deaths that are happening so we are targeting the areas where we know that where these things are happening so that's the top priority number one number two identifying um, those people who are asking for resources and getting them the resources and also making sure that we are meeting them where they are so the monday through friday nine to five that doesn't work for everyone another short-term goal with that would be working on the weekend holidays and the evenings when people are available to get the care that they need um, so that's kind of you know what our goals are and just identifying that so that we can bring those numbers back to you how many people are not just our office but impd um the the homeless population who are seeking the resources that are actually getting them and using them so that you will have that information first and for i'm a data person <laughs> so i love data and information and i'm sure that is going to help you as well to find out who in the people are in that are in your community are requesting services and getting the services well thank you very much that's a very um interesting and, and uh, good response i want to thank all of you again for being here and uh, you probably don't hear it enough but thank you for your service to our city all of you it's uh, really fantastic thank you councilman a, i'll just add from my mpd's perspective uh, we've already placed the lock sound boxes on all six of our districts uh, i believe we're going to start discussions with ifd about adding locks on boxes in other townships in iems to other areas of the city Additionally, I think one of the things that has come up from all of these conversations is a collaborative approach. Uh, so from IMPD's perspective, you know, we're doing the enforcement. Uh, we're looking at, you know, overdose deaths and then looking at the dealers. Uh, there's some, nine, I think, 900, Alfie, mm -hmm. last year, overdose deaths. And, you know, we're trying to target those individuals that are dealing that fentanyl uh, to, to uh, these vulnerable populations. But more importantly, I think what has come out of these discussions is when IMPD or our federal partners like DEA does a large uh, operation where we go in and take down uh, you know, uh, several drug dealers, we're going to partner with OPHS and, the, and some of the service providers to go back to that area to offer these resources, be, resources because what researchers have told us, like Brad Ray, who's been studying this for the past five years, is when IMPD does a big bust, or any of the uh, law enforcement agencies in Indianapolis, when, when they do a large bust, what happens is we see a spike in overdose deaths. Don't know why that is occurring, other than people feel like, okay, the police just came, so they're not gonna focus on this area. So we thought it was very um, strategic and, and in line with, this, with these discussions that we're having in terms of how we approach this is not just from an enforcement standpoint, but from a social service uh, standpoint of trying to help people break the cycle. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Councilor Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, how before we have a first, resp first responder and, uh, and a coroner, and the first responder gets there first. Uh, is there a drug that's given to someone that's uh, just a category of perhaps on the world to OD in on the spot. Is the first responder, is he equipped to administer a drug at that point or someone else has to be called in? Thank you, Counselor. Uh, yes, um, IFD has a very large footprint in regards to pre-hospital opiate care. Um, as you know, all 1,200 of our folks are trained EMTs 
and they're all trained in the administration of Narcan. So yes, when we respond to an emergency like that, all of our, all of our uh, firefighters are able to administer that, that drug. Hopefully the person will never come in contact with the coroner. Yeah. Uh, yes. I love you, lady. Thank you so much. I love you very much. Uh, Thank you. We just don't want to see you in those circumstances, ma'am. But uh, back to, uh, to the first responder, uh, it's an Ill illegal drug or narcotics. Could you repeat that, Do the please? first responder react to that? There's a law being broken there. My heart goes I, out to those that, for pleasure, for whatever, I, taking I have something to that to just OG and Adams. We don't at the same time, it's, it's illegal. We don't get involved in the law enforcement of it. We just treat the illness and, and transport to the uh, area hospital, if needed. On, on the, okay, you mentioned the wraparound services. Uh, the person is using an illegal substance. I can only speak for IFD, and, and we don't get involved in the law enforcement. Uh, we, we will treat the, um, any symptoms on the scene and transport accordingly to any area hospitals. And, and there, at this point in time, there is no follow-up from IFD. What, what's the process that happens after they get to the uh, emergency? What's the next step? on the wraparound service, how that person reached, the contact is made for that person. Who does that? Um, that is within the hospitals, actually. So when people are transported to hospitals, if they have suffered from an overdose and they survive, then at that point, the hospitals um, typically have peer recovery coaches, as well as they offer additional wraparound uh, resources for those patients that have suffered a non-fatal overdose. At that point, it is up to the patient to then seek the treatment or care that they want or need to uh, abstain from using drugs at that point. So I've had many discussions with hospital staff because ultimately it could go one way or the other. And we are on a overdose fatality review team that looks at what are the hospitals doing. So during the course of possibly you know, getting some additional funding, we look at working with the hospitals then also to find out how many people are they offering specific resources to? And then how many people are accepting those resources to get the help that they need? So that is gonna be sort of more of a future look at what else can we do in Marion County to identify those who are in need, who have suffered an overdose that is non-fatal, that want resources to get the help that they need to stop using? On, on, on the medication, when you get to the point of medication, are we talking about uh, one or two steps below that drug that possibly could produce an overdose and the services that's being offered? Do the drugs reach that level? Uh, of administration to to the person. The reason why I ask these questions, sir and ma'am, is because there was some well-meaning persons in our city that wanted to open up uh, a home that would house several persons that had challenges that you described, and some of the neighbors said that they did not think that was suitable for their neighborhood because they'd be giving away free drugs. Uh, how can we overcome that? Free, free drugs, those people are lined up to come get the free drugs. Uh, can you explain those type of drugs to be given at those sites of wraparound services? Oh, good question. So I was involved in those conversations, and the concern was that many people who suffer from substance use disorder are given medication-assisted treatment. So that could be Suboxone, um, I think it's naltrexone or something else. So there's a wide variety of uh, drugs that are given to people who are suffering from substance use disorder to prevent them from using opioids. Those drugs are specifically prescribed to patients. Um, and again, they're not uh, a drug that is, um, anybody can sell anything they want to sell, right? You can't be in control of that. But if a person is wanting to get the treatment um, of using those, those type of drugs that prevent opioid use, that's on them. So there are no drugs in our community that we would be providing um, in our wraparound services um, that are going to um, add to the problem of opioid use disorder. Now we would potentially in the future refer people to get medication assisted treatment. 
Um, and that comes in a variety of forms, and that's closely monitored by physicians that are providing those medications to those people. That is also listed as a top recommendation in the settlement um, in the settlement guidelines to make sure that people have the medication assisted treatment to stop them from um, using and abusing opioids. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council Muscari, then Councilor Ethan Evans. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a follow up question. Um, we're uh, allocating $416,000 to Narcan. Aren't we? already budgeted for that for this year with IMES -E -I, uh, I -E or IEMS? I'm saying, are, aren't we budgeted for that for the Narcan now? So I for can't, this year? thank you for that, Counselor. I, do, I don't have the budget information for IEMS. However, I will say we needed, we were picking up the amount of all stations, including the, um, the donut counties and making sure that, or sorry, the, um, excluded areas to make sure that they all have resources too we're also looking into maybe partnering with the parks in terms of getting them those boxes to make sure that they're full and they're and they're constantly being um, serviced so deputy chief adams mentioned the um the overdose response program they that end of it that program will also include making sure all those boxes are filled and so we needed a budget for that to make sure our, those those naloxone uh, boxes are filled for all areas of marion county and i'll just add that the point there is that these are new boxes these are these are boxes that don't have naloxone now and so the funding from iems would not support the boxes that are being proposed here Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Ethan Evans, please. <laughs> Thank you. I um, wanted to piggyback off something that Councilor Boots had mentioned about MCAT. I know um, it had been mentioned earlier this year about a potential pilot program uh, for a new uh, response team that would be uh, led with mental health clinicians and uh, EMT. Uh, would any of this funding um, be possibly going towards uh, that pilot or would that be uh, in the future budget uh, package? So I will say that um, some of the administrative money that's going is for the staffing is going to help build out those types of programs. And so we are still um, working with um, community organizations and internally to see how the clinician led program would operate. Um, and it is a pilot program and I, and I know the mayor promised that. So we're just making sure that we're laying the strong foundation for that to be up and running in 2023. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Renee, comments or questions? Then, I should have your hand up. Councilor Jared Evans, and then Keith Graves. Thank you, Councilor Chairman Graves. Robinson. Um, <clears throat> I guess I just wanted to, to follow a little bit up on what Councilor Barth was saying earlier uh, about the, the vehicle. Um, it seems like something like that would be housed under the Health and Hospital Corporation, Marion County Public Health Department, or whatever that entity is that we're working with. Uh, hopefully in collaboration, um, or even with OPHS or IEMS. Um, it, it would make me feel a lot more better about it, knowing that it's an entity that can continue to be funded and, and maintain the vehicles and that something doesn't happen a year or two or even three years down the road and we lose um, more so the services, not so much the investment, because I understand you'll probably protect that and make sure the vehicles return to us, but just establishing that, that seems like um, something that as a city we should be leading on and doing, not necessarily putting on to somebody else. So that's just more or less a comment. Um, the other thing, and Mr. Chairman, this is more just for us and the committee. I see that we've done a great job in collaboration here and many of these entities and, and people here representing them have been before us before. It just seems absent to me that the health and hospital corporation isn't a part of these conversations or at least at these meetings. Um, they are essentially the county hospital and our, our entity that should be helping to address substance abuse and mental health. Um, so I, I don't know what that looks like or how we bring them to the table or, or perhaps they're behind the scenes, but it seems like somebody from that entity should be with you all constantly in figuring out how we're collaborating and addressing. Um, one thing I love about our city is how we collaborate and we, we're all about 
using our, our uh, nonprofit supports. But one thing that frustrates me as a city councilor is sometimes it seems to me that this city um, for years and decades puts too much pressure on those entities and doesn't take things and put it on our own shoulders. We are the city government and we are responsible and I, I would rather see a, a stronger emphasis with the support systems that we as taxpayers fund doing their jobs and, and helping to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We actually do collaborate with the Marion County Health Department in all of these meetings. So the response team, it was actually, we have ongoing meetings. It's coroner's office, IEMS, Marion County Health Department, IMPD, OPHS, Overdose Lifeline, um, and RTI through Brad Ray, the, um, the individual that does a lot of this research over Indianapolis and digs into seeing where the issues are. So we are in collaboration with the health department as well. Thank you, Director, Councilor. Additional comments, Councilor Graves. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Keith Graves, District 13. Um, thanks for the presentation. I really appreciate uh, this collaborative effort. Um, and uh, Chief McGinty, you had mentioned that there was plans for community engagement. I'd like to hear more about that. And will you involve uh, members of the council? Because we do have uh, neighborhood leaders that we can rally to engage. And we do have uh, infrastructure in place for community engagement, door knocks, um, and we would like to be a part of that solution uh, to uh, get in front of some of those numbers that you mentioned. Thank you. Yes, in fact, um, I am going to be meeting in, a in another week um, with uh, Chairwoman uh, Jackson regarding some efforts r around um, trauma-informed care in the community. And she has already start to, you know, started to build that infrastructure of those community partners that will be providing trauma-informed care as well as information and education regarding substance use. We have seen a 16, a, a 26 percent increase in the African American uh, population and in our communities of drug overdose deaths. And so some of the efforts that she is involved with, we're going to meet so that we can expand that. And if there are any other counselors who have some ideas of what you feel, what you see, in your districts, because I can only look at where the numbers of the deaths are occurring, where we also see some other issues that are occurring in those neighborhoods, please reach out to me and we can bring that into the collaborative effort between all of our agencies. But yeah, there's already plans in place to meet with uh, Chairwoman Jackson to uh, address those issues. Since uh, 13 was on that list, I would love to be a part of any conversation. Um, again, uh, there's no shortage of, of interest and care for uh, the concerns that you're bringing um, before this committee. Uh, so I would love to know how we can rally behind what you are planning to do and, and bring our, our system that's already in place to help. Thank you. Thank you. That, that Thank makes you, it Chairman. stronger. Thank you, Councilman. Additional comments or questions? Anyone in the audience care to speak to this proposal? Seeing none, the children have any motion. Motion and property moved and seconded. Ms. Clerk, you will roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Renee? Councilor Renee, aye. Councilor Bain? Councilor Bain, aye. Councilor Barth? Barth, aye. Councilor Boots? Boots, aye. Councilor Carlino? Carlino, aye. Councilor Delk? Councilor Delk, aye. Councilor Ethan Evans? Councilor Ethan Evans, aye. Councilor Jared Evans? Councilor Jared Evans, aye. Councilor Graves? Graves, aye. Councilor Muscari. Councilor Muscari, aye. Councilor Mowry. Councilor Mowry, aye. Councilor Oliver. Councilor Oliver, aye. Chairman Robinson. Robinson, aye. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Proposal passes. Thank you, Ms. Clerk. Thank you, Councilors. Seeing no items on our agenda, we are adjourned. <laughs>